Sometimes we're challenged in life with different events happen. Things don't go the way we expect. We find ourselves being frustrated. And we wonder why God didn't move the way that we wanted him to. Well, if you've ever felt that way, we've got a message for you today. Let's get ready for the word. Our scripture text for today is a very familiar text. It's a short text, but it's a very familiar text. I believe not only with believers, but non-believers alike. And it comes from the book of Romans, chapter 8. That's the book of Romans, chapter 8. Verse 28 reads as follows. And we know that in all things, God works for the good of those who love him, who have been called according to his purpose. Amen. I want to share today from the subject of the God of the big picture, the God of the big picture. Let us pray. Gracious Father, we bless now this time that we spend in your presence and in your power. We ask now, God, that you bless this time that we spend in your word. And we ask, as always, God, that you would lead and guide us by the power and inspiration of your Holy Spirit. Fill me afresh. Use me for your will and for your glory. In Jesus' precious name we pray. Amen. The central theme of the book of Romans is the gospel and salvation of humanity. Romans 1, 16 through 17 says, For I am not ashamed of the gospel, because it is the power of God for the salvation of everyone who believes, first for the Jew, then for the Gentile. For in the gospel a righteousness from God is revealed, a righteousness that is by faith from first to last, just as it is written, the righteous will live by faith. In the early chapters of Romans, Paul lays out the gospel and the need for salvation. As we come to this eighth chapter of Romans, Paul delivers a powerful lesson on how our struggles and suffering meet the active hand of God. Life presents us with so many different challenges and so many different things during the course of our lifetime. We usually have no problems with the good things life presents to us. None of us have a problem when, when good paying jobs come our way. None of us have a problem when this newborn baby comes along and, and is just as cute as it can be. None of us have a problem when, when God opens a door for us to get a new car or to purchase a new home. We have no problem when our marriage is going good and, and there's love in the air. We have no problem when we have good health and sickness never comes our way. During these times, we have no problem telling others about the goodness of the Lord. But what happens when life starts to throw us a curveball, when our health starts to fail? How do we handle that? Do we still think God is good? If we get laid off, is God still good? If your child is born with some debilitating issues, is God still good? If your marriage turns into struggle after struggle, is God still good? The answer is yes. The problem is we are not viewing and living life with the big picture in mind. In other words, we're not living with eternity in mind. We want God to turn bad things into good things. We, when we are sick, we want him to heal us. When, when we're going through things, we want God to deliver us. When we're having, uh, getting fired on our job, we want God to give us a better job. When we have a bad relationship, we want God to give us a better one. But this isn't the true, and this isn't the promise. That type of understanding of this verse will cause us to be bitter and upset with God. See, God is more concerned with the ultimate good rather than the circumstantial good of our lives. The first thing I want us to see out of our text is this. In order to have a big picture view, we must have a view that is absolute. Paul says in the beginning of verse 28, and we know. Paul is making a statement of absoluteness. 32 times in his epistles and five times here in the book of Romans, Paul uses the phrase, and we know. Paul is declaring for the Christian 
that there are some things about God that are without doubt or question. And as Paul makes this absolute statement, he's letting us know that there are some things about God that don't come with question. There are some things about God that don't come with doubt. For God is holy. That's without question. That's without doubt. God is righteous. That is without question. That is without doubt. God is eternal. That is without question or doubt. Paul's experience and knowledge of God have led him to have a solid place of belief in God. See, his experiences and the knowledge that he's gained over time has led Paul to have this, this undying and this unwaverable belief in God. See, through the activity of God in our lives and experiences, we learn the same, same thing that Paul did. We learn that some things about God are unchangeable, that things about God are absolute. We learn through the activity of our lives and the knowledge that we gain that through salvation experience, God loves us. We learn that because God sent his only begotten son, Jesus Christ, to the cross at Calvary, expressing his love for humanity, expressing his love for all of us, not just for a few of us, but for all of us. He was willing to die so that all of humanity could have an opportunity to eternal life that all of humanity could have an opportunity to see salvation operated in their lives. But we learn through God that his ev love is everlasting. You see, he loved us even when we were unlovable. Yes, it says in the scripture that while we were sinners and at war with God, that he loved us. He loved us when we were unlovable. Now, if that isn't love, I don't know what love is. Because God loved us so much and because he loved us when we were in a sinful state, we learn that God's love is everlasting. We learn that God is always has always got our back. Yes, we experience the times when God has shown up for us and had our back in past times. And because of that, we learn that in the present time that God always has our back. What we've learned is that God is always present. That doesn't change for me. I know that God is always there. I know that even as David says, thou have been with me. Thou will never leave me nor forsake me. We understand because of the experiences and the knowledge that we gain through the word of God and through our experiences with God, we learn certain things about God that become solid in our lives. We learn certain things about God that become a foundation for us. We learn that God is trustworthy. His word is true and he cannot lie. We know that the scriptures are true. And even when you try to test it, some have tried to test the scriptures and say that they are not true and say that they are in error. But if you are really searching, if you're really seeking and you're honest, you'll find out that what God has said in his word is true. You'll find out that what God has said in his word will come to pass. You will find out that God has been up front and he's been honest about everything he's ever said or everything he's ever done. We've learned that God is trustworthy in all that he does. We get this absolute knowledge of God from our experiences of God. See, every time God moves in our lives, we learn something about God that we didn't know before. And because of the knowledge we gain of God, we can make an absolute statement just like Paul. See, because God has kept me through the rough times, I know that God is a keeper. Yes, when God has shown up in our rough times, when we have been going through life and we have been facing tough challenges here and there, and God has shown up and been our backbone in the midst of tough times, we learn that God is a keeper. Yes, because God has shown up and, and brought me through some difficult things and some difficult times, I learned that from God. And see, because God has made a way in the past, we learn that God is a way maker. Oh, hallelujah. We learn that God can make a way out of no way. And how did we learn that? Because he showed up in our lives and made a way out of no way. When you didn't know how you were going to pay the rent and you didn't have the money in your bank account and God showed up and made a way out of no way. Maybe he didn't give you money, but he may have given you favor. And as he gave you favor, he worked it out on your behalf. Why? Because God is is a good God and he's always moving and working on our behalf and because he showed up he's shown me that he can make a way out of nowhere or maybe you've been 
fighting battles, but you wound up fighting a battle and you didn't even have to lift a finger. And you learned that God can fight your battles and bring you out victoriously. Yes, we learn sometimes that God can move on our behalf and we don't even have to lift a finger to fight our enemies. We don't even have to lift a finger to fight our foes. God just shows up out of nowhere and he fights on our behalf. And because he's fighting on our behalf, we come out victorious. And when I've come out victoriously time and time and time again, and I haven't had to lift a finger to fight the battle, I learned that God will fight my battles. And what I've learned is to be able to make some absolute statements just like Paul has. Yes, what do you do uh, today when you find yourself going through something and God shows up and you've had that heart and mind changed and shifted because now you know. You see, what is it the time that you can come to that place where you can say like Paul said, and now we know. Why? Because the things and the circumstances in your life have been moved by God. God has been moving here and moving there in your life and you become just like Paul where you can make a statement of absoluteness and you can say now I know and now I know that God is a keeper and now I know that God will fight my battles and now I know that God will make a way out of no way and now I know that God is trustworthy and now I know that God is holy and now I know that God is righteous and now I know the only way that we can say that is because we've had some experience and some knowledge that come into our lives. We've had experiences with God moving in our life. We've had some knowledge come to us because of those experiences. And now we're able to say, just like Paul, and now I know. The next thing that we need to see out of our text is if we're going to have a big picture view, is we gotta have a view that is all inclusive. Paul says in the second portion of that text, That in all things, here is where the text really challenges us. Paul uses a very inclusive word, all. He's not saying 50%. He's not saying 85%. He's not saying 99%. Paul is saying 100%. What Paul has come to know and what he wants us to know is that behind Everything that is going on behind all things is a God that is moving and working. The challenge for us is that in all things, it includes the bad things. If God does not give us or bring about the change we desired or the outcome that we desired in our situations, if we're not careful, it can cause us to be bitter and have a bad attitude towards God. You see, job loss may not be a better job for you. Sickness may not result in a healing for you, but you just told me God could do all things and he can. Everything that God does, he does for a purpose and he does it with the big picture in mind. But see, we have to have an eternal perspective and not a temporal perspective. As I said on last week, God deals in things that are eternal and not temporary. God wants to deal in those things that are everlasting and ongoing. He doesn't deal in things that are temporary. What he wants us to know is he, again, he's not a temporary God. God says that in all things, it doesn't matter if it's a good situation. It doesn't matter if it's a bad situation. He says in all things, yes, even in the things that we find ourselves troubled in, God is saying all things. All things that happen in our lives, there's a God that's moving behind the scenes. All things that are happening in our life, God is actively working it out for us. In all things, let me give you an illustration of that. There was a young man who was putting together a puzzle, but he had a difficult time getting it to go together. His father walks into the room and he begins to put the puzzle together in no time. The son says, how come I couldn't do that? Well, the father says, because you were looking at the pieces I was looking at the big picture. That's what God does while we're looking at the pieces of our lives and we're wondering why this piece isn't fitting together with this piece. We're wondering why things didn't work out over here. We're wondering why this didn't turn out the way that I wanted it to. Well, God was looking at the big picture. God was busy putting the puzzle together of our lives, but he's putting it together according to the big picture. Don't get caught up looking at the pieces of your life and miss out on on what God is trying to do in the big picture. See, if we get caught up looking at the pieces of our lives and we get caught up wanting God to work things out in a certain way or in a certain manner, we'll wind up missing the big picture that God wants us to see. 
Don't get so selfish that you miss the big picture. Realize that in everything that's going on in your life, even right now in the midst of this pandemic, God is working it out. Even in the midst of everything that is happening, God is working it out for the good of them that love him. God is working on behalf of those who love him. God is moving behind the scenes. Yes, there may be some who have lost jobs, but God is moving. There are some who don't know what tomorrow brings, but God is moving and he's been moving and he's going to keep on moving behind the scenes, working things out on our behalf. Yes, we have a good God and he's always moving. He's always working on things that will benefit and glorify his kingdom. He's always moving in a way that will bring out the best for you. The final thing that I want us to see out of our text is this. In order to see the big picture as God does, we must have a view that assures. The following and the remainder part of that text says God works all things for the good of those who love him and who have been called according to his purpose. The word in the text, the Greek word for work is synergy. It means that God is working and ruling in all things. Yes, it means God is creating and eliminating. He's placing and replacing. He's connecting and grouping. He's pressing and stretching. He's arranging and influencing. The word work is also present action, which means that God is continually working things for our good. Oh, hallelujah. It doesn't mean that God is sometimes working for our good. It doesn't mean that every now and then God is working for our good, but it means that in all times and in all things, God is working for our good. Yes, God is moving. He's he's replacing and he's shaping and he's molding, he's shifting and he's bringing in and he's taking out. He's doing all of that for our good. And he's working it out on our behalf. And it's not just sometimes, but he's continuously in an ongoing way, working behind the scenes of our lives, putting in and taking out, picking up and putting down. He's constantly working on us and for us that he might get the good out of our lives and that he might have the most good for us. Amen. Hallelujah. When I understand that God is working, he's continuously working on my behalf and he's continuously working in and out of my life through the good and the bad. Even when it doesn't go the way that I wanted to go, I still should know that God is working and moving on my behalf. See, Paul is telling us that God is always working through the situations of our lives for our good. But what does good mean? The word good in the text in the Greek is agathon. It means the ultimate good. There are two tip, different types of good. There's situational good and there's ultimate good. God is not about the situational good. He's about the ultimate good. Oftentimes we look to God to, to make our situations good. This is not what Paul means here. Yes, when we talk about situational good, again, it means that we think that if, if I get fired today, that God's going to be me a better job tomorrow. It may not be that way. And in fact, he doesn't even promise that. But what he says is I'm working in all things. That means even if it's a bad situation, I'm still working in it. Even if it doesn't turn out the way that you think it ought to, I'm still working in your life. God says I'm working in all things, whether they're good or whether they're bad. They're all things. If you lose your job, no, you don't get a better one. But God is still working. If you get sick and he, he doesn't heal me, but God is still working. If I'm in a bad relationship, but God is still working. What Paul is referring to in the text is the ultimate good from God. God is looking for our ultimate good. He's looking for the good that will benefit us long term. The good that will benefit not only us, but all of humanity. One of our mentors always says this. God works things for the one so that for the benefit of the many. Yes, oftentimes what God is doing in the world, he's not only working it out for you, but he's working it out on somebody else's behalf. He's working and he's moving on your behalf, but he's doing it so that somebody else might get the good out of it too. Oh, hallelujah. When God understands this and, and yes, and God has a bigger picture in mind and he shows us that in verse 29, when he says he wants the believers to be conformed to the likeness of his son. 
One of the reasons that God is working things out in our lives is so that he can conform us to the likeness of his son, Jesus Christ. And as he conforms us to the likeness of his son, Jesus Christ, guess what that does? It makes this world a better place. It makes this, this life worth living. It makes all of life better. Why? Because God is moving on our behalf and he's shaping and molding us and he's conforming us to the likeness of his son, Jesus. And because he's conforming us into the likeness of his son, Jesus, we are beginning to look more like Jesus. We're beginning to act more like Jesus. And as we do that, it winds up making it better. Oh, Lord, it makes the world better. It makes our lives better. Why? Because God is moving and he's shaping and molding our lives. This is a Bible verse that you hear both Christians and non-Christians quote. Yes, everybody believes that, oh, God is working things out for my good. Yes, but according to the text, it's conditional. God is not just working it out for everybody's good, but according to the text, he says, I'm working it out for those who love me and those who are called according to my purpose. Because we love God, we place ourselves under his power and his control. You see, the believer's salvation and deliverance is purposed by God. You see, the believer's position and behavior are involved in the call of God. Positionally, God chooses the believer by setting them apart through the Holy Spirit and through belief of the truth. Oh, hallelujah. When we hear the gospel message, we believe the gospel message. And as we believe the gospel message, we accept by faith the atoning work of Jesus Christ on the cross at Calvary. And by faith, we put our trust in Jesus Christ. By faith, we put our trust in the atoning work of Christ. And by faith, we are saved. And it's not by works or oh, we would be bragging and boasting, but it's only by the grace of God that we have been saved. And that wasn't of our own. It was by faith that we put in that grace that God gave us. And when he gave us us that grace and when we heard the gospel message we put our trust in that and when we put our trust in the, the gospel message we were saved by grace oh hallelujah and not only that but he's also working in our behavior yes he's called us according to his purpose our behavior our God calls us to believe as believers to not only be believers but to be pure and to be holy he did not just call us to get saved and sit around and wait to go to heaven. He didn't call us to come and live like we've been living even before we got saved. He's called us into a glorious relationship with his son, Jesus Christ. And as he's called us into that relationship, he's called us to a higher standard of living. He's called us to live a pure life. He's called us to live a holy life. And yes, because he's called us to live a pure and a holy life, he's working things out on our behalf. Yes, God is always moving on our behalf behalf. Yes, even the text says God is moving and we know that in all things God is working it out and he's moving for the good of those who love him and that are called according to his purpose. By the time Paul fin finishes making this all-inclusive absolute statement, he's letting us know that no matter what's happening in your life, no matter what's going on, that God is working it out on your behalf. Just look at some of the examples through scripture. Yes, even in the Old Testament, you look at the life of Joseph. All of the things that happened in Joseph's life. Joseph was so into slavery. He was hated by his brothers. He was then sold and put into prison because somebody lied on him. And then he was brought in to Pharaoh. Oh, but my God, if Joseph would have never been lied on, if Joseph would have never been put into prison, if he would have never been brought before Pharaoh, then the, the people during that time may not have survived. His family may not have made it, but he understood. He said, you meant it for my bad, but God meant it for my good. Joseph understood that God was working a big picture here, that God has something different in mind that God had a bigger understanding than I had but he got in line with God and when he understood yet some bad things happened in my life some things didn't go the way that I thought they should go but God worked it out on my behalf and just look over in the children of Israel when they were taken into captivity over in Babylon yes they were taken into Babylon captive and they were mistreated over there and yes and they were abused while they were there and but uh, Jeremiah told them just stay here in this captivity and God is going to deliver you. God is going to work it out on your behalf because God says, I know you. I've got a plan for you. I know you because I got a future 
and a hope for you. I don't plan to leave you here forever, but I've got some things that I'm working out. I got some things that I'm working on your behalf for, and I'm working them out for your good. Yes, you're in captivity now, but I'm still moving. I'm still working on your behalf. Yes, you're going through some hard things now, but I'm still moving. I'm still working on your behalf. Yes, you may find it difficult in life now, but guess what? I'm still moving and I'm still working on your behalf. But the best example of all is the cross at Calvary. Yes, even on the cross at Calvary, Jesus Christ was in a bad situation. He was hanging between life and death. He was hanging between two criminals. He was hanging there on the cross at Calvary. That was a bad situation. Hanging on an old rugged cross, not feeling too good on your back. Hanging on an old rugged cross about to check out of this world. And he lifted up his head and looked up to the Father and said, Father, into thy hand I commend my spirit. Why? Because he understood that God was moving on his behalf. He understood that even though he was in a bad situation and it wasn't working out the way that he wanted it to, it wasn't going the way that he would have desired it to go because it worked out the way that God wanted to. And because he went through all that he went through on that cross at Calvary, my, 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 because he did all that he did on the cross at Calvary and because God was behind the scene shaping and molding and moving and pressing and stretching and doing all that he does, he made it so that we could have a right to the tree of life. Why? Because Jesus Christ died on the cross at Calvary. But early Sunday morning, he got up out of the grave with all power in his hand. Early Sunday morning, he got up out of that grave and he made it possible for you and for I to have eternal life. Because early Sunday morning, Jesus Christ got up for the ultimate good. He got up so that your life could be good. He got up so that my life could be good. He got up so that the ultimate of good of God would be worked in our lives. He got up so that God plan and purpose could be worked out because Jesus, one individual went through a bad situation. Was it desirable? No. Was it the best thing? No, but God worked out his bad situation, not only for his good, but for the good of all of humanity. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. So we got to understand God is not just looking at the pieces of our lives. He's looking at the big picture. So I encourage you, don't get caught up looking at the pieces of your life, but look at the big picture. Amen.